Hello and welcome to this clip going through an extension question on water crystallisation. It's from the 2006 Royal Society of Chemistry, Chemistry Olympiad Round 1 paper. The Chemistry Olympiad is a competition that uh, is open to sixth form chemists and indeed people uh, lower than that in year 11 perhaps. Uh, the questions are usually harder, significantly more uh, difficult than your average A level paper. Um, and uh, they require a bit of deduction and problem solving rather than simply memorising lots of different ideas. So the idea of water crystallisation is quite straightforward. You may have even done it in class before. So it's based on this uh, simple equilibrium where you can heat hydrated copper sulphate to get the anhydrous version and drive off the water of crystallisation and by difference calculate the mass of water and therefore the number of moles of water. Now the issue is that copper sulphate, whether it's hydrated or anhydrous, decomposes during this heating process. So what the graph shows you is uh, the various stages of that decomposition. So what you're go you've got to do in the first question is using data from the graph suggest formulae for compounds A, B and C. So if we start with A, it's obviously the first thing to uh, be produced, the first stage of the complete decomposition. So, knowing that the decomposition is going to likely break up the sulphate ion, let's think about what bonds might break first. But before we jump on that sort of uh, idea, if you look, you've actually got six stages. So, therefore, you also need to consider the fact that copper sulphate has five water of crystallization molecules. You can see that from the question a bit further up. So, it's quite possible that you need to break the bonds between the copper sulphate lattice and some of its water crystallization molecules first. So the question says uh, using data from the graph. Now if you think about the data from the graph, the data also includes percentage mass loss. So what we've got to do is work out the uh, molar mass of copper sulphate hydrated. So if we start with the molar mass of um, hydrated copper sulphate, we get 249.6 grams per mole. And if we look at the loss of mass in percentage terms using the y-axis, we can estimate by difference how many waters that might be. So if we work it out for A, we lose two H2Os. That's 37.44 approximately. We can do the same for B and C quite easily uh, by working out what 27% loss in mass would be and what 37% loss in mass would be. So what you can see is happening is you're getting successive amounts of H2O taken off. So the next part of the question, which is part B, says on heating E, a reaction occurs to form F, identify E and F, and write an equation with this reaction. So redox means that one species gains electrons and is reduced, the other species loses electrons and is oxidised. So it's obviously a transfer of electrons from one thing to another. Now if you're watching this clip when you're quite sort of early on in your A-level career, you probably haven't come across um, the idea of redox yet, but let me try and fill you in a little bit as we go. So an oxidation number is a representation of how many electrons um, an actual atom is using in bonding. So if we were to consider the sulphate ion, you can see that there's two double bonds and, once, uh, and two single bonds. So if we think about the fact that in one of those covalent bonds, whether it's a double or a single, each line represents a sharing of electrons. So we can count up the number of electrons that each individual atom there is actually using to bond. So for oxygen you can see quite clearly that it's two. So one electron is the minus charge, one electron is shared. And for the double bonds there's an electron from oxygen in each of those um, single bonds within the double bond and therefore it's two electrons for that, those oxygens as well. That must mean that sulphur 
is um, sharing six electrons or undergoing bonding using six electrons. So now what we need to think about is the oxidation number of copper. So all metals, when they form ions, have then an oxidation number the same as the charged mass ion. So copper 2 plus will have an oxidation number the same as its charge. Looking at the sulphate ion, a single bond is obviously weaker than a double bond. So the S single bond O will break first. That oxygen that breaks off will then combine or stay with the, the copper. So let's put a couple of arrows in just to highlight what we're talking about here. So that leaves us with CuO. And if we think about what's happening to Cu, um, it's going to reduce even further. So oxygen maintains its oxidation number of minus 2, because plus 2 and minus 2 in CuO, for example, would give you an overall um, charge of 0, which is a neutral compound like you'd expect. So to turn one into the other, you just have to make a little equation. So in order to do that, you have to think about how E becomes F. There's one copper in E, two coppers in F, so that means two lots of CuO are needed. So if you put two lots of CuO to make one lot of Cu2O, there's some oxygen spare. So that must mean that oxygen is given off as a gas. Now the interesting thing here is when you actually do the equation, you'll realise you have to put half a mole of O2 in. That's actually okay. That's allowed in chemistry. You can put improper fractions in as well. So if that's say one and a half, that would also be acceptable. Now the next question is quite hard. So let's look at this process we're talking about. We're talking about CuSO4 going to D and going to CuO. So the question tells us that D is formed when exactly half of the original copper sulfate, CuSO4, has turned to CuO. So from earlier in the question we knew that two moles of copper oxide were needed, CuO. So therefore if there's two moles of CuO produced, there's two moles of CuSO4. So two moles of copper sulphate is 319.2 grams. So if you remove 50% of that, that now means there's 159.6 grams left. So D must have two coppers in it to make uh, two CuO. It must also have one sulphur atom. So this gives us Cu2S. The problem is going from D to E is a further loss in mass. So that means D must also contain oxygen. So you have a, a copper, sulphur and oxygen containing compound that has two coppers and one sulphur in it. So if we take a little bit of a jump here, during the decomposition, that decomposition means breakup. So we have copper, sulphur, and oxygen containing compound that further decomposes. What's likely is some kind of gas is given off. Now, we know that CuO um, is what's left behind. We know that there's two moles of it, because there has to be two coppers. So we can do something with the sulphur. So sulphur dioxide gas is something that could be produced. So in order to work out what D is, we need to think about what we've got to produce. If we imagine that SO2 gas could be a way of getting rid of the sulphur, because we end up with Cu2O, eventually that's your F, because we worked out earlier, plus half an oxygen molecule. The only way that could work, so it all balances out, is to have Cu2SO5 as an empirical formula for a compound. So, hopefully, it's been a useful roundup of this slightly tricky um, last bit. But uh, in the meantime, thanks for listening and see you soon.